Thank you so much. And thank you again for the invitation. And it's my pleasure to be here um, to tell you a little bit about our past work and then kind of lead into what was the motivation behind developing this, um, this mosaic microscope. I'm going to tell you about that towards the end of, um, towards the end of my, my talk. As, as is, um, I want to just start off uh, by actually acknowledging the most uh, important part of my journey is my collaborations with uh, a host of amazing people um, from, from Harvard, uh, where I did my postdoctoral work, uh, Eric Betts' group at Genelia when he was still there, his group, the Megasin Lab, most of the zebrafish work that I'm going to show you was in collaboration with, uh, with the Megasin Lab. Uh, the Drubin Lab is now my, my uh, uh, colleague upstairs uh, who develops like gene-edited organoids. I'm going to show you some examples using um, adaptive optical lattice light sheet. Um, and then we worked with Ed Boyden's group on uh, combining um, uh, lattice light sheet microscope with expansion microscopy, so you can get scalable uh, super resolution on a, on a tissue scale. Um, and uh, um, let's get started. So really the only introduction you need for the next uh, few minutes um, is that, okay, well, you can take this beautiful cell on the cover slip. Um, if you wanna image the ventral dynamics that are attached on the, on the surface, uh, you don't need to use anything other than turf because that, you know, confines the excitation almost entirely within the depth of focus of the subjective. It gives you amazing contrast um, and great signal to noise. Uh, really, there's not a better tool for studying these ventral dynamics. However, if you want to study anything away from the cover slip, uh, you need to do some sort of um, confocal sectioning to be able to get um, a, a good uh, signal to noise. And the way that happens is using a pinhole to focus the light at the particular depth of focus. And you can change the depth of focus either by moving the objective or by the sample. But you notice that you're illuminating the entire volume of the cell for collecting a single point over here. Of course, you can multiplex this in a, in a, in a spinning disk context where you're collecting um, 2D optical sheets by using a bunch of um, uh, pinholes focusing the light. But again, notice that you know, for every 2D optical section, you're basically illuminating the entire volume of the cell. So it's highly uh, photon inefficient. Uh, light sheet technology has been around for about two decades, and it's an amazing and transformative tools, especially when it started out um, in the application space of being used for developmental biology. Uh, it's great because you're able to get cellular level resolution, uh, no problem, large fields of view. Um, the issue to study subcellular uh, dynamics becomes that uh, using traditional diffracting uh, light sheets, such as like a Gaussian light sheet, tends to give you relatively um, thick, thicker light sheets. Um, thicker meaning that you know it's either you know uh, larger than the depth of focus of a high NA objective, um, or uh, you can make it a higher NA object uh, light sheet, but then it kind of compromises your field of view because um, it's converging and diverging very rapidly. And this was until um, Eric Betzik's group in 2014 developed the lattice light sheet, um, where they used non-diffracting beams, uh, uh, basically placing vessel beams at particular periods. Um, so if you take a cross-section of the, of the light sheet, uh, you have these vessel beams. Um, and a single vessel beam by itself is still a pretty poor choice for a light sheet because you have the energy in these higher orders. But when you bring these vessel beams at particular uh, periods or at particular lattice positions, um, what you're able to do is interfere out these higher orders such that you get basically most of your energy confined within the central order. Of course, this still doesn't look like a light sheet, so what we do is we use a galvanometer to spin it very, uh, or to sweep it uh, faster than our exposure time to create a, a very thin um, propagating light sheet. Of course, we can take advantage of the modulation um, in signal and phase uh, and use it for structural illumination microscopy for 3D super resolution live imaging. Uh, so what does this all mean practically? Well, let's take these gene edited cells. So these gene edited cells have been gene edited for um, fused with a, a, a GFP on a um, adapter protein that's responsible for um, generating these self-assembling clathin-coated pits. Uh, basically, clathin-coated pits are responsible for you know, how cells eat or bring in majority of the, the nutrients into the cells. So if you're now looking at these gene edited cells, what we do is we have imaged using the spinning disk confocal and the lattice light sheet, and we're imaging it just as fast uh, in the lattice as the, the spinning disk, this particular spinning disk can handle. Um, and we put in just enough power so that the starting signal to noise for both of these volumes um, is about the same. And what you're looking at here is the top-down view. So this is like a volumetric um, uh, sample. Uh, you'll see basically that about you know almost 50 times faster photo bleaching on a spinning disk confocal if you're doing three-dimensional volumetric imaging um, compared to the lattice light sheet. 
So with this, we kind of apply this technology to a host of different problems over the years. Um, so we've looked at, you know, how phosphodiesterotide conversion takes place at the site of endocytic vesicles. Uh, we've looked at how viruses start to um, internalize um, uh, into these cells. In this particular case, we're looking at how rotavirus particles, so these are pseudoparticles that have been uh, reconstituted um, with different inner uh, core material and outer core material, um, such that when you lose the outer core material, which is the, um, uh, the green, uh, that's basically when it has access to the sialic acids in the plasma membrane to be able to internalize itself. Uh, we've looked at um, uh, escort dynamics. So this is now trying to understand mechanistically the dynamics of how you form um, these is um, uh, tri AAA ATPase uh, polymers in order to create interluminal vesicles. Um, we've also, or we're starting to, to look more closely at um, how the trafficking is taking place between ER and Golgi, and this is like active work that's, that's taking place. Um, and then uh, all of the examples I've shown so far are of cells on a piece of glass. Uh, what we wanted to do is be able to achieve the same level of resolution, uh, diffraction limited resolution that we have in these settings, but be able to do volumetric imaging um, inside of living um, or physiological systems like organoids or, or intact transparent animals like zebrafish. When you don't care about life um, in certain instances, uh, we want to be able to get more resolution out of them. Um, and um, that's the story I'll briefly tell you about. Okay, well, what happens when we combine expansion microscopy, which is a way to kind of bypass the laws of physics um, to be able to attain uh, super resolution with, uh, with this method. So uh, just as again, frame of reference, this is a single cell. I'm just kind of rotating that cell around to kind of get a visual for the three-dimensional nature of this particular cell. Um, using the lattice light sheet, uh, this unit itself, we're kind of now being able to track every single endocytic event uh, that's taking place in the entire volume of this particular cell. Well, this is great because we get to learn a lot, especially when we repeat this um, several, you know, dozens of times in, you know, dozens of cells. We can kind of, you know, characterize the different behaviors of each of these um, uh, endocytic pits and the diversity of behaviors that these pits in the entire volume of cell present. This is great, um, especially because we're looking at this in a simplified system. But the question remains: How can we make this more physiological? So this is work that came out a few years ago. Um, and we started by uh, using uh, genome-edited uh, intestinal organoids. So in this case, we're expressing clathrin and dynamin, and these are embedded and kind of held together in these matrix gels. Um, as you can see, uh, right off the bat, you basically don't have these diffraction-limited spots anymore. You basically have more like a fuzz. The reason we have a fuzz uh, is because um, the light sheet that's traveling to the region of interest in this particular sample or its organoid um, is basically hitting uh, the cytosol and the nucleus, uh, cytosol and the nucleus of various cells is passing through. Every time you kind of go through these changes in refractive index, the light sheet starts to scramble. So by the time your light sheet kind of gets to where, you know, you're trying to image, it's already kind of completely scrambled. Anything you do manage to excite here uh, is going to try to make its way back to this detection objective. And that's light is also passing through uh, different levels of cells and cytosol and nucleus and other uh, cellular material, and basically that's also getting scrambled. And the third thing is there's going to be a focus offset because of Snell's law. Uh, when this light sheet kind of hits this curved surface, it's going to bend a little bit. That means that where it focuses is no longer going to be where you know the two objectives are supposed to be. So we need to fix these three problems in order to be able to recover the resolution lost in these uh, organoid systems. So an ideal cross-sectional light sheet kind of looks something like this um, for a multi-vessel pattern. Um, when it kind of goes through an aberrating media, in this case, we kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, pass it through uh, about, I think, 2% agros, um, and the light sheet starts to bloom a little bit. And then uh, what we do is we take the, the um, uh, basically the, the, the phase error of this, subtract okay. that from the ideal transform of this, inverse transform that such that the pattern that we inverse transform when it passes through the aberrating media, it will now yield back um, the corrected um, cross-sectional light sheet. So that's basically how we fix the, um, the excitation side of things. The detection side of things, um, we're using a approach that astronomers have developed many decades ago, um, uh, where they're trying to observe um, these stars from ground-based telescopes 
Um, but the problem is that this light that's traveled, you know, thousands of light years comes without any problems until it hits our stratosphere um, or atmosphere. And, and because of the, the moisture and the clouds and all of that, it kind of completely gets scrambled. So what they've done is they created an artificial star by exciting the sodium atoms in the stratosphere. Uh, they know the shape and size and you know the properties of this guide star that they're they're, they're generating next to the real star that they want to image. Uh, they measure basically uh, this by bouncing this off of a deformable mirror uh, and a control uh, loop where you know you're using a Shack-Hartman wavefront sensor to measure this aberrated wavefront and then uh, adjust the shape of this mirror such that you now have a, a correction for this distorted wavefront. So you're now able to de-blur um, basically the, the stars. We use a similar approach um, in, in um, our adaptive optical lattice light sheet where the two photon creates our guide star. Uh, and instead of exciting sodium atoms, we're basically exciting the fluorescent molecules that are within our imaging uh, region of interest. To correct for the focus, um, we basically send light through from both of the objectives and image them onto the same camera and then see what the offset is and use a galvanometer to adjust the, the light sheet position such that it matches the, the focal um, plane of the detection objective. By implementing all of these three things into a single microscope, we're able to recover that lost resolution. Um, so this um, is great because um, we were able to image uh, organoids, but we want to be able to now move on to image in more complex systems. So one of our favorites is um, zebrafish because like us, it's a vertebrate um, and it, it's mostly transparent. So we've went ahead and uh, done the adaptive optical uh, lattice light sheet on these, uh, on these zebrafish and we'll show you a few examples, but just to give you a sense of scale, that's that single cell I was showing you that was kind of um, a turning. Uh, and this is a, a multi uh, tiled um, uh, volume that's been um, corrected with and without adaptive optics. And you can basically see the night and day difference it makes um, with adaptive optics versus without adaptive optics. For the next few examples, I'm going to show you um, on the bottom right, uh, just a schematic of the fish, just to give you a you know, sense for how old the fish is and where we're imaging. So in these few examples, we kind of continue the theme of imaging through um, the different uh, tissues about here, imaging endocy endocytosis um, in these different tissues. And what we interestingly found is that when we surveyed over, over a dozen different tissue types, we found the greatest amount of difference between uh, the brain cells and the muscle cells, uh, meaning that the muscle cells have much longer lived events uh, compared to the, um, the endocytic events uh, in the brain. And we kind of have an intuition as to why this is. Um, and this has to do with the membrane tension of the, um, of the, of the cells in the muscles versus the brain. So that way, um, the, it, the muscle cells require, the endocytic pits in the muscle cells require actin uh, to more or less complete the endocytic events in a reasonable amount of time. Um, next, we looked at um, organelle dynamics uh, in, in zebrafish. Um, so one of the challenges here is that, well, we're looking at you know, several things at once. We're looking at membrane, Golgi, endoplasmic reticulum, and uh, mitochondria. To visualize all of these at once is more of like a nightmare scenario because you basically have no perception of what which cell belongs to what. So the first thing we did was we we're able to leverage the, the, the membrane signal here to be able to delineate um, all of these cells uh, that are in the volume of this particular tissue. And then what we did was we computationally separated out each cell such that you basically have a view of individual cells as you know one is used to studying but with a preserved morphological context um, of all of these cells so in this case you can see these dividing cells here you can see these um, um, uh, amorphous blobby looking skin cells over here uh, um, this is the hindbrain of the zebrafish so these are the precursor neuronal columnar cells over there uh, another mitotic cell there and in a second, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off all of the cells except for just one so that we can focus on the, on the quality of data and the types of questions one can ask with these, um, with this level of uh, detail that we have access to in these microscopes. So I'm going to turn off everything except for this one particular cell. Um, so in this case, uh, what we did was because um, both the Golgi and the membrane were in the same spectral channel, we computationally delineated them because we know that the Golgi and the membrane are not going to be spatially overlapped. Um, so we have the mitochondria and the ER. And what I'm showing you here is the rough distribution of the organelles as a distance from the membrane. 
So when the cell starts off an interface, these organelles are roughly evenly distributed. And we can track the volume and surface area of this particular cell over time. Um, and in a few seconds, you'll see that the cell starts to round up. So that means that it's kind of entering mitosis. So when it enters mitosis, the surface area drops. You can see the mitochondria is more peripheral than the other two organelles. Um, and when, it's, when the cell goes through cell division, the membranes redistribute, so the organelles redistribute, and the surface area of this particular cell recovers. Um, and um, uh, yeah, both of these daughter cells roughly have similar, similar volumes um, and similar surface areas after, after cell division. Um, in another example, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of cell motility um, in zebrafish. So what we've done is we've generated the xenograph model where we're able to inject uh, human breast cancer cells into this uh, zebrafish. So these breast cancer cells are in green over here. And uh, the vasculature of the zebrafish is labeled in magenta, so the endothelial cells. And we kind of see different examples of cell migration. So in this case, this guy is squeezing through these narrow um, vessels. And then, you know, as part of that squeezing through, it does kind of dilate the, the vessels a little bit, in this case over there. Um, over here, it's kind of rolling on top of these blood vessels. And you can kind of see these, um, these um, long ciliated looking structures, um, potentially making these cash bonds as they kind of roll through or roll on top of these, these blood vessels. And in the last example here, we kind of see this particular cancer cell trying to extravasate out of this blood vessel. So trying to metastasize. And we know that it's trying to metastasize because if you track the surface area of that particular green cell, it's starting to increase over the course of, um, uh, increases by about 50% over the course of about two hours or so. Um, and in the last example in this section, I want to kind of show you, um, you know, in one field of view. Um, so we're here, here we're imaging, um, again, um, the ear, region of the ear of the, of the zebrafish. So we're trying to study this endolymphatic duct and sac um, that's regulating pressure. Uh, as the ear develops, but you can kind of see the, the immense diversity of biology that's taking place in this one field of view. So in this one field of view, um, we can basically look at these, these like this ruffling and dancing skin cells. Uh, you have this hindbrain on the bottom. You have a blood vessel right here that blood vessel, uh, blood cell, red blood cells are kind of zipping through. You have these endothelial cells right there. This guy particularly that enters into mitosis. Uh, again, the, the endolymphatic duct and sac, the, the pressure relief valve that I was telling you about. Uh, immune cells that are just crawling around, you know, kind of, you know, sensing and doing their 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 duty, um, and it's it's an immensely kind of complex thing um, that you're able to collect in just one, um, uh, I guess, region of interest, uh, eleven different cell types in this particular volume. So so with this adaptive optical light sight sheet, what we were able to do is be able to record dynamics at the scale of uh, nanometers and milliseconds to really understand their consequences over the scale of microns to minutes. Um, and to really kind of visualize their long-term outcome at the scale of several millimeters over several days or sorry, several hours or several days. Um, we can do you know, quantitative um, in vivo cell biology in multicellular systems, whether it's organoids or in uh, transparent um, organisms um, uh, with diffraction limited resolution because we're able to recover that lost resolution due to aberrations. Uh, and with the right reagents, uh, we can calibrate these microscopes such that we can get signal molecule sensitivity um, using something like halo dyes or, or JF dyes. So I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and tell you about um, our other work where we combine uh, lattice light sheet microscopy with expansion microscopy for, again, rapid, scalable, super resolution of, of tissues. Here we're looking at uh, two neurons um, in the somatosensory cortex. Uh, with vastly different um, uh, pre- and post-synaptic uh, connections. Uh, but I'm going to kind of jump right into it in the interest of time. Um, so take this tissue slice uh, of a mouse brain, and we're not zooming in or anything like that. We're basically we've infiltrated this particular um, tissue with, um, with an expandable uh, polymer uh, resin. Um, and uh, once you digest it, everything out and uh, all the macromolecules of interest are anchored to our our polymer network, we basically expand it by removing the salts. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, what happens is we're basically physically making, uh, ex expanding this, this tissue. That means that every molecule is still in the same place as it was, except now it's separated by, a, you know, the expansion factor in all three dimensions to every other molecule in this particular sample. Um, and again, this um, we can use various types of um, swallowable polymers. Um, 
Um, uh, in this particular case, we're using uh, sodium polyacrylate um, and basically pre-expansion, post-expansion. Uh, one of the nice things of expansion is that um, it naturally clears the tissue of all of the scattering elements. So we don't need to worry about, you know, doing the refractive index matching for, you know, clear tissues. Um, so that comes as a byproduct of expansion. So using this, what we've done was um, we were able to map with, again, um, uh, better than diffraction limited resolution, um, all of the components in, in this tissue. So in this particular case, we're looking at one soma where this is a thigh one YFP mouse lung. So this particular soma is filled with um, YFP signal, but it nicely excludes all of the compartments within this particular soma. So we're able to segment out all of these compartments, uh, be able to kind of you know, quantify you know, shapes, dimensions, and all of those interesting things, um, and be able to identify a subset of these as either uh, mitochondria, which are gonna be shown in magenta in a second, um, or lysosomes in yellow. And we're basically able to, again, characterize the shapes and morphologies of these um, organelles. Um, and again, we've done that in, in the soma, we've done that in dendrites, and we've done that in axons. Uh, and you see that you, know, you have larger mitochondria in the soma and the dendrites compared to the axons, because it makes sense because axons are pretty constricted um, and very, very thin, thin structures. So again, this is one field of view. So what can we do with um, if you wanted to image something larger? Well. What we've done was we mapped the entire somatosensory cortex, um, this region of the tissue. <clears throat> uh, so this is about um, uh, uh, pre-expansion. This is about two millimeters by about a quarter of a millimeter by a quarter of a millimeter. Um, and it took us about uh, 18,000 volumetric tiles per channel uh, to be able to collect this particular volume and then stitch it together. Uh, but the quality of data um, is, is pretty impressive in the sense that and this one giant volume, we were able to collect uh, information about the pre and the post synapses um, associated with or without these glomerulonic neurons, uh, and we were able to collect more than a hundred times the, the the information that exists in all of literature today, which is very very cool. Um, and we were able to kind of quantify, you know, the the distances for all of these, so you can get a broad distribution or the or the Homer bassoon uh, distances for um, objects that are associated with these glutaminergic neurons. So we can basically see that, okay, well, there's a, a tighter distribution for, for the ones that are associated with the glutaminergic neurons versus not. So again, this is still uh, a portion, uh, again, a very, very minor, uh, in tiny fraction of the, the whole mouse brain. But if you wanna get a more systems level thing, we kind of went to like the fly brains where we're able to image the entire fly brain. Um, so what we did was we've imaged um, uh, these fly brains that are expressing these, uh, um, signals in these dopaminergic neurons. Um, and then um, here, what we've done is we've stained it with, um, uh, for NC82 is like a presynaptic uh, marker. So that's like that speckly white thing that you're looking at. And we wanted to ask, okay, well, can we use expansion microscopy to be able to count and lo locate every single synaptic position in this entire fly brain? Well, the first thing we need to figure out is um, do we even have sufficient resolution uh, to be able to figure out the, the localization at these really dense regions? For example, the mushroom body um, is responsible for memory and learning. Um, and we act, act, had access to this um, uh, FIPSIM data set, which is volumetric EM um, data set, where uh, at Genelia, it took them about one year to collect this uh, volume, which is one one hundredth of the fly brain. Uh, and they spent 10,000 human hours manually annotating the location of every single synapse in this particular FIPSIM. And they realized, okay, there's about, um, there's about um, uh, uh, 90,000 synapses in this particular mushroom body. Um, and most of these are within, um, um, within uh, 200 to 250 nanometers um, at their densest um, uh, position. So, Again, being that we are diffraction limited divided by the expansion factor, so sub 100 nanometer, about close to like 70 nanometer resolution, uh, we definitely have more than enough resolution to be able to localize um, every single synapse in this entire volume. So we went ahead and you know, basically wrote um, the code to be able to determine that position. And it turns out that in this particular tissue, there's about 40 million synapses and about only about half of them are uh, dopaminergic neuron associated. So this is great because this is a gr good segue into what we're trying to do um, here at Berkeley. So everything I've shown you was with um, what I'm referring to now as the current expansion lattice. So to image the fly brain, 
took us about three and a half days. Uh, with the mosaic, which is the next generation um, microscope that we're building at, at Berkeley, it's really about 50 times faster. So we can image that entire brain in, in less than two hours. Um, <clears throat> and um, again, um, the, the expansion lattice has its own niche uh, separate from the EM world because it's able to answer questions, uh, of course, with an order of magnitude worse resolution than, than FIBSIM. Um, but you know it's able to do those with molecular contrast, which the Fibsim cannot do, um, and um, you know be able to kind of um, go at you know problems that are too large even for you know dozens of Fibsim to be able to handle in a reasonable amount of time. So um, this is what the microscope um, that we used for everything I've shown you today looks like, um, and you can see here um, that you know this is on a ten foot optical table. Um, majority of the components that went into building this microscope, you know, these visible lasers, AOTF to modulate, spatial light modulator to, to shape the wavefront, two photon laser for the guide star, uh, Galvos, objective sample stages. It turns out that, you know, we can basically use all of these to build the adaptive optical or the expansion lattice light shoe microscope. But it turns out that we can also use a subset of these or all of these with uh, additional components for you know, different types of microscope, like a point scanning microscope or a vessel light sheet microscope, 3D phase or 3D SIM or airy scan. Um, and then we figured, well, why not we just you know, reuse these optical components um, and design a system such that we're basically able to leverage um, um, one microscope that's able to reuse all of these elements to basically you know, have you know, the, the functionality of about seven to 10 different microscopes. And the added benefit is that because we have more things, we can basically, um, you know, impute everything with um, adaptive optics if that particular imaging mode is able to leverage that. So this is basically what we've um, <coughs> what we've designed and built. <coughs> so this has three um, imaging stations. So you have the light sheet configuration for the samples that are uh, over there. You have the inverted objective. Again, these are all um, the similar high end uh, objectives. And then you have an upright station if you want to have a mouse or, or something that can basically use a lot, lot of freedom um, below this particular station. So we built this at Berkeley. Again, uh, amazing team um, here doing a lot of hard work. Uh, so we have two of these at, at, at Berkeley. Um, and really the secret sauce of what makes it, oops, secret sauce of what makes this microscope um, possible is that we have these custom designed uh, optoelectronics um, where basically you're able to push a button and open and close these, these um, um, mirrors that will change the light path. Um, and it does that such that you transform one microscope um, into a different microscope such that you can image uh, with multiple modalities onto the same, um, uh, same sample um, if, it can, if it can leverage that. So um, that being said, you know, there's bigger problems with these microscopes, specifically in the context of these, this is 50 times faster than the previous gen. That means that we're able to generate a lot more data in a, in a small fraction of time than what we were able to do before. So uh, we built this advanced bioimaging center here such that we bring together you know, the biologists, the imaging specialists, and the data scientists to be able to work together on problems, again, um, that are too immense for each of us to work on independently. Um, and I kind of want to show you uh, a little bit about what we do in terms of a computational space as well, um, because um, not only are we interested in generating great um, biological data sets, but we're also interested in understanding the biology. And to do that, we really need to build like quantitative tools. So um, my postdoc, uh, Zhang Tao, has been working on um, improving the ability to do uh, three-dimensional uh, point source detections. So he's able to basically um, uh, pick up really weak signals um, and be able to quantify these uh, with pretty um, pretty uh, impressive um, uh, accuracy metrics um, than anything else that's been published um, before. Um, again, I have a team that's working on segmentation because this is, believe it or not, uh, not a solved problem for us. Um, we basically have diverse range of biological specimens with different signal to noise, different types of uh, staining, and basically building um, uh, 3D deep learning architectures to be able to do, you know, segmentations and being able to do um, uh, basically quantifications of these cell states. Um, we're also kind of um, going into uh, molecular prediction, 
where we want to be able to study one uh, molecule at diffraction limit and be able to understand its correlation and its its relation to um, other related molecules that you know appear with or around at the time of this particular molecule. So we basically want to be able to predict, well, in this particular case, whether or not a clapping coated event will be successful in the sense that in a, in a cause decision or will be an abortive. Um, so we've been kind of exploring uh, on this particular front. Um, and then the last um, uh, big um, 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 uh, position uh, that we're focusing on is being, being able to make um, um, deep learning based sensorless adaptive optics, meaning that we have um, basically a, a pre trained model that we're working to develop um, where it's able to recognize the um, uh, the aberration um, and it's uh, we're able to correct it using a deformable mirror such that our corrected wavefront um, will allow us to basically get close to diffraction limit uh, resolution. Um, so again, uh, the Advanced Bioimaging Center is really, um, the whole point of that is to make these advanced microscopes accessible, and it really is open to international investigators, so please feel free to get in touch if you have scientific problems that, um, um, that could, you know, be helped by these, by these tools that we're building. Uh, I'm happy to stop here and basically take any questions.